All right, good morning. It looks like a few folks are continuing to join. Uh, we'll give you maybe one minute to get settled in with that coffee uh, and, um, uh, and appreciate you being here for the CBO May Revise update. We'll give you one minute and uh, then we will launch into this important discussion today. All right, we see those numbers continue to climb, but we want to uh, be respectful of your time, so we're going to get going. Good morning. I'm Tasha Davenport, CASBO CEO, and I'm so pleased to have uh, Bob and our GR team uh, sharing the May revise. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted to uh, first is to thank you for being here, but also every time that we really kind of dig into the budget, I'm always compelled to go back into you know, our programs from 1928, when we were founded 95 years ago, with a very specific purpose of studying a deep study, deep insight and research around the budget and administration and how it affects our school. So that has not changed. And one of the things I wanna share with you is in these publications, again, from 1928, what we see is just the tremendous impact that our CBOs were able to make in shaping some of the uh, budget considerations. Um, so they really saw it and they used the terms opportunity and responsibility as they were looking for their, their changes and how those changes would impact the future of school business, school budget, and the CBO role. So as you digest the information today and provide that feedback, I just wanna encourage you to uh, realize that tremendous responsibility that we're not only providing and shaping the budget of today, but really setting the tone for generations to come. And uh, I, again, appreciate your interest. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to uh, our CBO Professional Council Chair, Bob Wittenberg. And Bob, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tasha, and good morning to everyone. Um, I cannot think of a busier time of the year to ask you to join us to discuss this important information. Uh, last night, I was attending a scholarship night. I've got graduation ceremonies this week, and it's just a wonderful time of the year. So we understand the commitment for you to be with us today. I am joined today by a team of the Governmental Relations Group, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, good morning. This is Elizabeth Escavella. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of Government Relations for CASBO. Um, just to share a little bit, um, prior to coming to CASBO, I worked for both the, the Senate and the Assembly, so then Assembly Member Bill Dodd, and then former um, Senator Alex Padilla. So I have background in having worked in legislation in the Capitol, and I also have worked um, at two different school sites in East Oakland, helping run their College and Career Center. So education is uh, very dear to my heart. And um, want to just also share that, please, any questions you have in the chat, um, incorporate any questions you may have, put them in the chat. We really want to have this be um, engaging and we want to be as helpful as we can throughout the entire presentation. And I'll go ahead and kick it off to Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Michelle Gale. I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy with CASBO. Um, I just joined CASBO in November, and prior to that, I was with Assembly Member Jose Medina's office, um, and I've been with his office till 2017, um, you know, working on his legislative policies, especially his education, K through 12, healthcare, human services. Um, I also advocated for the California Immigrant Policy Center for a year, uh, but then when Assembly Member asked me to come back, uh, that office was amazing, and the policies he worked on were near and dear to my heart. So I went back. Um, I also have had great experience working with Elizabeth um, when I was with Assembly Member Medina's office on higher education um, bills and special education funding bills. So it was a pleasure and now I'm happy to be with CASBO. Yes, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll just quickly share that um, CASBO's budget priorities are determined and developed by our legislative committee. 
and that is made up of our executive committee members and a representative from every section that we have, as well as two at-large members. And they got together last October to think about what do we want our budget priorities to be come 2023-2024. Um, it's very helpful to be proactive gather your thoughts and information on what you want your priorities to be in the fall. So those conversations can be had with the Department of Finance and with the legislature as they're looking to develop what the governor's budget proposal is gonna look like come January. And so I'm really happy that our legislative committee was able to come together. And uh, I'll go ahead and share uh, what our budget priorities are and how they've been integrated um, into the May revision and what our positions have been. So first and foremost, um, pretty standard year after year, CASBO's Legislative Committee wants to continue to prioritize fully funding the statutory cost of living adjustment that provides us the most flexibility in terms of what we are able to do with our funding so that we can meet our students and our community needs. And so we were really um, happy and we're very supportive of fully funding the statutory COLA, which in January was 8.13%. And as we know now in the May revision, we're seeing that increase up to 8.22%. So that's an increase of about $3.4 billion when combined with declining enrollment. Um, what is a little bit concerning here is that the May revision does use about $1.7 billion in one-time Proposition 98 funding. And so we get a little bit of heartburn when we see one-time dollars going to ongoing costs. So. Um, again, the 8.22% COLA is also being applied to the programs outside of the LCFF, we, which we have historically seen with Governor Newsom and are very pleased, especially for those that are special education, county offices of education, and school nutrition. And the next slide is on the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant. And so CASBO did oppose the budget proposal to reduce the $1.2 billion in this block grant that was included in 2022. Um, this was unfortunate to see because we were given $3.5 billion. The first half was allocated in the fall and the second half was expected to be allocated in the spring. What's really interesting, interesting about this is that the um, legislation itself does not require CDE to distribute these dollars by a certain time frame. So it really allowed the governor to hold on to these dollars and even just make that 1.2 billion reduction. And there was a, a lot of pushback on this from many organizations, um, both on the labor and on the management side to say, hey, you're giving us a mid-year cut here. Um, we were supposed to see these dollars. And to our surprise, the May revision includes an additional $607 million reduction. And so essentially the governor's budget right now, as we see it, is reducing that funding by about 50%. And the governor did in his press conference refer to 20, uh, Proposition 28 uh, to offset some of these modest adjustments. So we're kind of seeing um, a little bit of a hand-to-hand -hand when it comes to the $933 million that we're seeing in Proposition 28, as opposed to the 607, in comparison to the $607 million um, in the cut. So that modest adjustment, um, but we clearly know that the discretionary block grant, we're able to use it for a lot of things. So making that six additional $600 million cut is very problematic because it cannot compare to the strings that are being attached with Proposition 28. Yeah, and Elizabeth, I'll add to that. From a CBO perspective, when dealing with our cabinet, this was really shocking. It was like our one pot of gold that we had for discretionary use. And to hear that that might be threatened um, was just like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And speaking with our colleagues across the state, there was that same sentiment. We heard testimonies of districts that had already hired full time music teachers, only later to find out they might have to pivot and be forced to make uh, very difficult staffing decisions. So we um, we appreciate CASBO's support in opposing this. And um, we're hoping for good news in June, but we're, we're not certainly optimistic that things might change. So we're going to have to adjust and um, kind of revise our plan moving forward. 
Yes, and a friendly reminder on this is that this was the legislature's proposal back in 2022. And so during our advocacy days, it was a kind reminder to the legislature, thank you for this discretionary block grant. We're seeing the cut in the administration's budget proposal, and we have a lot of concerns with this. So uh, we are pleased to see that the Senate is rejecting this proposal in, in, in its entirety. So um, for LCFF equity multiplier, uh, there have not been any changes since the January budget proposal came out. It is still ongoing $300 million of um, uh, Proposition 98 general fund money. Um, and, you know, CASPO appreciates this proposal, but it is extremely narrow, and we would recommend the governor to expand the threshold of accessibility for the students for the equity multiplier. Um, just a rem reminder, the eligibility school sites are determined by the percentage of uh, free or reduced uh, meals for students. Uh, for middle schools and elementary schools, it is 90% threshold. And for high schools, it is 85%. There's also a minimum of $50,000 going to each eligible school that is qualifying for the equity multiplier. Again, um, in the Department of Finance, uh, a lot of briefings, it doesn't seem like there's any ap appetite to change uh, this funding mechanism. Um, there was a statement by the California Legislative Black Caucus that they applaud the governor for his investments, including the equity multiplier that they've been fighting for. And should the governor assembly continue to agree on this, uh, we're not anticipating any changes to uh, this distribution method. And I'll just uh, quickly add to, to Michelle's point that uh, we we did not take a formal position, but we still wanted to make a statement because CASBO did provide a recommendation for that different threshold. Yes, and um, for um, ELOPs right now uh, in the May revision, um, you know, they are only proposing to um, expand the program. There are not any programmatic changes. Um, the extension was not in the January budget but CASPO had been advocating for it and was really appreciating to see it in the main revision. Um, this is supported and much appreciated because so many LEAs are still building and revamping their programs, and especially because of staff shortages. So we definitely appreciate seeing this in the main revision. So I'd like to just quickly jump in here and brag on the CASBO advocacy team. Um, this is remarkable. If we've ever questioned whether or not our voice is heard in Sacramento, this is proof that when we come together and we are participating in CASBO conferences, um, committees, um, we have a chance to voice big concerns. And if it wasn't for this advocacy effort, we don't believe that we would see this change in the May revise. So on behalf of CBOs across the land, thank you to CASBO for your strong position on this. Thank you, Bob. But uh, the, the credit really does go to our legislative committee who actually thought about this idea in October. And um, it's really nice to see that uh, priority come to fruition and we hope it continues to stay during our advocacy days. It seemed to be a no brainer with all the legislators that we were meeting with. Um, so we, we're keeping our fingers crossed that this will um, will continue to push through in the final budget. All right, so let's take a look um, at our K-12 education highlights. If we go to the next slide, I'm gonna read a brief CASBO news break. Governor Gavin Newsom released the 2324 May revision, which reflects a shortfall of 31.5 billion up from the 22.5 billion in the governor's budget. Although it's a time of uncertainty, it does not predict a recession and the governor is not looking to dip into reserves at this time. It's worth noting that the economic fallout from a debt limit impasse, higher interest rates, uncertainty in financial institutions and delayed tax receipts can impact future revenues. When we think about um, some of the things that John Gray shared last week, we think of the themes of uncertainty, risk with this year's budget. Um, when we look at this slide here, due to the statute regarding an increase in capital gains tax receipts, a $2 billion contribution from Prop 98 
is being applied to the public school system stabilization account. Um, in the spirit of maintaining strong support of public schools, the governor's May revision repurposes one-time allocations to the LEAs previously received, received the fully funding of Prop 98. This was actually quite uh, peculiar to many people in that typically when revenues dip, you're going to see an effect on Prop 98. What was nice to see is that the capital gains came in much higher than had been expected. We know that Newsom wants to present a balanced and healthy budget. And if he's looking at a potential run for future office positions, um, he definitely doesn't want anything to look weak in the California state budget. So we believe this was a, definitely a political move um, and we'll see again how this shakes out in the uh, final budget in June. Going to the next slide, Prop 98 reflects a three-year decrease in the minimum guarantee of $2 billion below budget proposal, and the May revision now estimates it to be um, a little bit lower than had been projected. This results in 23706 total per pupil spending and 17444 in Proposition 98 per pupil spending, a decrease of about $17 per pupil. Uh, the good news is that test one continues to be projected for all three budget years. Um, what's nice about test one is it is not sensitive to an ADA drop, which many, many of us are experiencing with our decline in enrollment. Um, so that insulates us a little bit from, from that trend. We can go to the next slide. I believe- the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant. Um, I, this is just a reminder that this was uh, um, granted to us back in the Budget Act of 2022 under AB 182, and so it provided $7.9 billion in one-time Prop 98 funds to help address learning recovery for youth through 27-28. So pretty much uh, it's very flexible for, for LEAs to be able to use uh, for learning recovery. And so we didn't see any cuts to this in January, but it was surprising to see that the May revision does propose a decrease of $2.5 billion. So that reduces the allocated funds down to $5.4 billion. Um, AB 182 was passed with, with a two-thirds vote, and the funds have already been allocated. So it is right now unclear how the state is going to recover these appropriated funds. Um, I think originally people were thinking, well, there's $7.9 billion in the emergency block grant versus the 3.5 billion in the arts and music discretionary block grant. So why are they taking money from the discretionary block grant and not the emergency block grant? Well, the conversation came about the two thirds vote. And now what we're hearing is that maybe back then it required a two thirds vote to pass. Now, will it need a two thirds vote now in order to be able to decrease the funds that have already been allocated? Um, and again, this is um, very problematic. This is a mid-year cut. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that CASBO will continue to oppose because we are going to oppose any of the mid-year cuts that are being provided. And the Senate in this case is actually modifying the reduction of the block grant to $525 million. So it is um, still a mid-year cut, but at least we are seeing that the Senate, although they're not rejecting this entire proposal, they're reducing the amount that the May revise is proposing of $2.5 billion and only reducing it by $5.25 billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and similar to the arts music grant, uh, this created some panic for local districts as well in that we had a plan, we have things in motion, and the thought of um, having funds pulled mid-year is, um, it just puts a, an enormous amount of pressure on cabinet, um, even with negotiations, because monies maybe we had allocated for um, compensation, we're going to have to rethink all of that. So we're hoping for the best on this one as well. Yeah, and I, I think the reality is that with um, declining revenues, there's going to need to be a cut somewhere. However, Caswell continues to say, before cutting us mid-year, mm -hmm. go uh, fully fund us before you create new programs. 
like fully fund what you have already committed to instead of creating new programs. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but this is a, something that personally, I, I think we're going to see a cut somewhere in either one of the two law grants. I also want to note that I appreciated during the legislative committee last week, the Department of Finance was, was assuring us there would be no mid-year cuts. And our legislative members called them on the fact that these, you can call them whatever they are, but these are mid-year cuts. And so uh, I, I appreciated that candidness uh, and directness from our legislative committee. And so I did uh, mention Proposition 20 earlier, and I wanted to incorporate some additional information here because there continues to be a lot of talk, a lot of confusion um, regarding how this is gonna all play out. So just wanted to um, reiterate that the May revision does provide $933 million in 23-24, and it does propose to do the following changes. It allows um, for the payments to be issued through the Department of Principal Apportionment Program, provides a feasible way to calculate funds for and issue funds to preschool programs. And they wanna clarify the terms defined for the purpose of the three-year time limit on the use of the funds, the department's authority to collect data on unexpected funds from LEAs, and the department's authority to recover those unexpected funds back to the state. And so as we're having this conversation about confusion, um, CASBO is working alongside a co group of um, other organizations and LEAs to help define what is existing funding for the purposes of the initiative's requirement, uh, because it does say that LEAs need to and shall use these funds to increase funding of arts education programs and not supplant existing funding for those programs. And so there continues to be this confusion of what is defined as existing funding. And what we are proposing is that any statutory definition of existing funds should only include funds over which the LEAs have governance over. And so what that means for us is any of those dollars that we're getting from nonprofits, any money that we're getting from a PTA or a PTO, we should not be held against that. We don't know if that's going to continue to be a priority for these nonprofits, for these organizations, for these um, parent groups. And so please do not... Um, again, hold, hold these funds against us. Um, the second one would be that any statutory definition of existing funds should only include ongoing state funds. And so what we're seeing right now with the arts, music, and discretionary blog grant, those are one-time dollars. They're clawing those dollars back. So um, we, we feel like this should be really focused on any ongoing state dollars that are not, that we can govern over. So that, that's gonna, that's a request that we have. Um, and I, I guess I will also note too that uh, because Proposition 28 is a proposition, any changes, whether they're technical in nature, will need to require a two-thirds vote. So it'll be interesting to see where the learning recovery block grant reduction, where is, is it, that's going to be part of the um, and part of its um, education bill that's going to require a majority vote, or if they're going to keep it safe, play it safe, and incorporate. Um, that within a, another bill that includes Proposition 28 so that they both can require a two-thirds vote. Yes, um, for education, the May revision continues to fully fund um, the first and second years of exp expanded eligibility for transitional kindergarten and allows the continuation of waiving family fees. Um, the first year cost to add additional staff to every TK class um, has revised from $337 million to $283 million, and the second year cost remains the same. Um, these funds will increase the Prop 98 guarantee through the process of rebenching. The budget trailer bill language also proposes to prohibit the State Board of Education from waiving any racial requirements for, for transitional kindergarten classrooms, and the Senate also agrees with that. Um, on to the County Offices of Education. So in the May revision, we are seeing a new $80 million ongoing increase 
for county offices of education that serve at least one juvenile court and one other alternative school setting. And that's gonna increase the base grant from 200,000 to 300,000 beginning in 2023, 2024. There is a block grant that is equivalent to $5,000 per juvenile court or community school ADA and an increase of 50% to the base grant for differentiated assistance. Um, there are some other statutory changes to the funding model. Uh, so for specifically the increase for the LCFF base rate for county offices, um, they have applied the 8.22% COLA. So they're receiving the same COLA as the LCFF, um, but the altered ADA calculation for COEs um, to be based on the is to be based on the greater of the current prior or average of the three most recent prior fiscal years beginning in 2023 2024 and so if that sounds familiar it's because this is something that the school districts were able to receive in last year's budget and so that is now being applied for county offices of education the block grant specifically can be used for a broad range of allowable expenditures uh, including expanding access through A through G, A through G courses, vocational career uh, education training, and post-secondary preparation. Um, on a side note here, um, there was a piece of legislation that was introduced by Assembly Member Mike Gibson that represents the Los Angeles area. It was called, it's called AB 906. And there was a lot of conversations around this additional funding. And historically, we see that when the state provides um, an amount of ongoing or increasing ongoing Prop 98 dollars, there sometimes tends to be some accountability measures that come along with it. And so with AB 906, there were some conversations taking place. The bill uh, was set for hearing, but then was pulled. So it was, um, it became a two-year bill. However, we saw that same um, information that was in AB 906, we saw that now in the May revision. However, um, there's still conversations happening around the accountability measures. And so we do anticipate trailer bill language that may uh, provide some, some strings attached to this, this funding should it move forward. So the Senate has already expressed that they wanna see some sort of accountability when it comes to providing additional funding for COEs. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so when it comes to school nutrition, the May revision provides an increase of $300 million, $110 million one time and $191 ongoing in Prop 98 general fund to fully fund universal meals in the 22-23 and 23-24 fiscal years. I know this has been a big question of when might the universal meals go away? Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, in working with my local team, their sense is um, the participation rates have gone through the charts, uh, where we used to have only X amount of kids participating in school lunch program. Now we have kids, even kids with means, um, are choosing to um, enjoy those free meals. Um, studies obviously show that the link between good school nutrition and high achievement, um, huge correlation, so that's a positive. One of the potential drawbacks that we're seeing is um, a little bit of an entitlement culture. If the meals are free, then how about some other things as well? So um, some behavioral challenges we see in the cafeterias um, from some of the students. But overall, we see this as positive. When kids are well-fed, they tend to be able to focus on their learning and their achievement. So that's overall good news um, from our perspective. I'll add something here to the school nutrition piece. Um, there was this $15 million carve out for dishwashers, dishwasher grants. Um, I know it made our, our legislative committee um, laugh a little bit. So that was from the uh, funding that was being provided under the kitchen infrastructure grants. And so there was this money and and the legislature, the, the governor said, hey, let's go ahead and take some of um, that oh. infrastructure grant dollars over to um, create $15 million for um, just commercial dishwashers. So that was seen as something that was energy friendly. Instead of having to use plastic, uh, let's go ahead and fund some dollars for dishwashers. And so uh, Senator Pornitino had a bill that was introduced and made it through the legislature, got to the governor's desk and the governor vetoed it. And then to our surprise, we ended up seeing it as part of the proposal. Um, and 
right now the Senate, they're saying, yes, um, let's go ahead and take that $15 million outside of the infrastructure, or the kitchen infrastructure grant, but let's still fund it using other funding sources. So um, we'll see how, how that goes, um, but that was just a really funny thing for our legislative committee to have seen, okay, let's, let's carve out $15 million for our, a commercial dishwasher. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. Uh, so obviously a strong push for greater literacy uh, Senator Anthony Portantino, um, he's attempted legislation before that was primarily focused on screening for dyslexia. Um, in this proposal, he's actually broadened the um, the term for reading difficulties. Um, I don't know anyone that would argue um, against literacy. It is the foundation of learning at the high school level where I work. We see that where kids have good literacy skills, they're able to really pick up the content from all the other disciplines. Um, so. We see this as a positive. Yeah, so the um, the, the difference here between the, there is a difference um, within the Portantino bill SB 691. So that would actually have required this to begin 24, 25, unless there was a student's parent that was objecting to this. Um, so the May revision provides a little bit more flexibility in terms of the implementation beginning in 26, 25, 26. And uh, it does provide a million dollars because they want to create a panel of experts to approve a list of screening instruments. Um, last Thursday, the Senate and the Assembly cleared the suspense file. So these are bills that were in the Appropriations Committee, and which means any bill that is tagged fiscal uh, has to go through the Appropriations Committee. Senator Anthony Portantino is the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, which is a very influential position to have. And he actually held his own bill on the suspense file. And I think that's a good indication to say, I see that there's funding and that this is part of the May revision. I'm going to go ahead and hold my bill back because it's already part of the budget or what it's being proposed in the budget. So when you have it in the May revision and um, you have uh, the Senate support for this, it's most likely going to make it to the final budget. Educator workforce. Um, in the mayor vision, um, we saw statutory changes for educator workforce programs, which included increasing the teacher and school counselor residency grant program um, allocations, um, authorizing the commission on teacher credentialing to issue a comparable California credential to any US military service member or their spouse who possess a valid out-of-state teaching or service um, credential. Um, to go with that part, um, our legislative committee just last week took a position on SB 811 by Senator Jones. Uh, what that bill does is, you know, for teacher credentialing, it creates interstate teacher mobility compact. So they would want California to be part of uh, this compact and actually be the one of the founding fathers. Um, this compact will allow teachers to use an eligible license held in a compact member state to be granted an equivalent license in any other compact member state. So that would lower the barriers for teacher mobility um, and would bring more teachers to California. Currently, um, I was told, you know, that it's, the process is really long, can take up to 10 weeks or even more, but this would make it to uh, 30 days just to kind of compare if you have a license that is equivalent or same as California's. And then lastly, it would also allow residency candidates to complete uh, their service requirements in eight years instead of five, along with the flexibility to fulfill their service requirements by teaching in schools outside of their sponsoring districts. And I think here we can continue to see the governor's commitment to all the educator workforce programs that he has funded in the last couple of years, and even more so with trying to address staff shortages, trying to provide some additional incentives or flexibility so that more people can take advantage of these programs. Michelle, you wanna? Yeah, so I can uh, get us started on what we are looking forward to and what is next. 
Uh, so next slide will give you a bit more details of what we are doing here uh, in Sacramento and monitoring also. So currently, trailer bill language um, is being released and, you know, CASWA has started to analyze it and we will be working on a news break and be sending it out also with all the details. Our legislative committee met last week. Um, on May 18th, uh, we had discussed the May revision, what positions CASBO will be taking, what our priorities will be for that as well. Uh, we were able to also have really intimate conversations with um, LAO, Legislative Analyst Office, and Department of Finance. We were able to ask them questions, uh, especially because there are discrepancies between what LAO is suggesting, um, especially, for example, LAO, LAO is saying that right now their proposed budget seems to be. $10 billion below what Department of Finance is saying. And also LAO is saying that a 5.1% COLA could be realistically funded without implementing any mid-year cuts because they are projecting that big uh, $10 billion uh, revenue to be not there. So, you know, our folks, our ledge committee were able to ask questions in regards of that. Then with also Department of Finance, we were able to ask their side, but they seemed optimistic that they will be seeing revenues in October. So things should be promising then. Um, we also worked on CASPO's May revision um, uh, response. And, you know, we are obviously really happy with the COLA. We are supporting the universal meals. Uh, we are continuing to support the block grants and opposing any cuts taking place. Um, and then we support the continuation of TK expansion and also supporting the carryover of ELOPs. Um, now we're also looking forward to legislative budget hearings. Senate has already started with their subcommittees. Um, there was just a hearing yesterday with their school finance, um, education finance committee, and we are still waiting to kind of finalize things on the assembly side. And June 15th, the budget has to be passed. So we're just looking forward to what will be taking place in the next weeks. Yes, and on, on this note, um, when it comes to the legislative budget hearings, uh, the, it was uh, interesting because the Senate was pretty quick. So yesterday, the as, we, um, as Michelle had mentioned, the Senate Committee on Education Finance Subcommittee won. They ended up meeting, they took action, um, which is why I was able to share some of those actions throughout the entire presentation. But one thing I do want to point out is that they are looking to pull back some of the one-time dollars to help fund the ongoing LCFF cost. So that um, is, is nice to see, but it also means that they have to take away from other funds. And uh, going back to CASBO's budget priorities and recommendations is fully fund what you've already committed rather than, uh, rather than creating new programs or before creating new programs. We also know that there's um, also other programs that you can bring or pull money back from. And the LEO actually provided two really good, um, provided a really good recommendation for that. And that was the $1.5 billion in last year's budget that would go towards zero emission school buses. And so what we're seeing here is that the Senate is actually choosing to shift that funding to 24, 25 and 25, 26. And that's gonna be a billion dollars. So they're helping free up a billion dollars for those purposes. And they're also deciding to reduce the Golden State Pathways grant program by $400 million. So you're seeing that they're taking proactive initiative to try to find sources elsewhere so that they can try to make us as whole as possible and or to fully fund the the COLA, the 8.22%. That was something that was very important to them as part of the budget hearings. They kept saying 8.22% COLA, we want to fully fund it. And they are able to fully fund it because of certain clawbacks and other um, funding programs. The two things that we do see that are new that the, the, the Senate is trying to provide is an ethnic studies block grant. That's a $20 million. And the, again, the commercial dishwasher grants at $15 million. Okay, next slide, please. So there are other issues that are part of the CASBO budget priorities that are not reflected in the May revision. So we'll continue to advocate. Um, uh, to, we'll continue to advocate on behalf of this. Um, on the facilities funding, we are supporting AB 247 by Assemblymember Murutsuchi. Uh, the bill was recently amended to put a, uh, put a $15 billion allocation amount 
and also to incorporate transitional kindergarten, not just kindergarten as part of um, this, this bond. So we're really appreciative that there's an understanding and a recognition that we do need uh, additional facility dollars, especially as we continue to roll out our UTK program. Um, when it comes to pensions, we've always asked for additional um, pension liability pay down on behalf of the general fund. I know that um, at least last year in the discretionary block grant, that was a, an opportunity for us to help pay down some pension liabilities because we, we had that at our discretion, even though it was Proposition 98, we've usually always asked for the general fund. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're seeing um, a lot of cost pressures on the general fund side. So it's a little bit hard to have that expectation um, but we'll continue to advocate for additional funding to help pay down because we know how important it is and how helpful it is to be down these employer liabilities for CalPERS and CalSTRS, especially as we continue to see increases to CalPERS on the employer contribution side. Um, it is interesting, though, because the state is, um, they are actually paying down liabilities uh, unfunded retirement liabilities, but that's on the state side, not the not on the school employer contribution side. When it comes to addressing the staff shortages, uh, we are supporting now a bill that was introduced, SB 765 by Senator Portentino, that would allow for some uh, additional hiring flexibilities for retirees. And so during um, COVID in 2020, the governor provided an executive order. We knew how helpful that was. And that was something that we wanted to continue to see. So that was a, a CASBO budget priority that was not in the budget or in the May revision. However, we saw it introduced as a piece of legislation with, us, us, um, with Tony Thurman, our state superintendent, being the sponsor of the bill. On the transitional staff qualification, uh, transitional kindergarten staff qualification, the budget in January proposed to create a new requirement for an adult assigned to the TK classroom beginning in 28 29. And so we know how hard it is already to address some of these staffing shortages. So we think that this will only exas exasperate the problem. And so we have taken uh, an opposed position on this new requirement. Um, what is um, really nice is the Senate is actually also choosing to reject this proposal. Okay, a few practical applications. Uh, for many districts across the state, negotiations will be a greater challenge this year. Uh, we're hearing this from school services. There is going to be a huge push, as Tasha just put in the chat for a question, for bargaining units to ask for the entire 8.22% COLA. So one of the things that's going to be challenging is educating members of that unit, as well as staff in general, that COLA is really intended to address more than just salaries. That's a message that is often unpopular, but it's something that needs to be repeated um, regularly. You know, when you think about declining enrollment, even with a healthy COLA, if you're experiencing declining enrollment, you're not going to get that full percentage. And so if you give that much more away than you could afford, um, you're going to be in a world of hurt. You think of what the um, LAO's office is recommending. They believe we can afford maybe a 5.1% COLA. Well, that's obviously lower than the 8.22. Um, I would rather deal honestly with what the state can afford than get people super excited about an 8.22 um, and not be able to deliver on those high expectations. Uh, with so much uncertainty in the state budget, conservative MYPs can be a huge safeguard, again, to be uh, conservative and proactive in those out years with the MYPs. I think that's going to be very, very crucial moving forward. So we look forward to June. We look forward to seeing what actually happens with this budget and um, definitely appreciate all the collaborative thought and conversation that goes into helping us um, move each other forward as we make some of these difficult decisions. Michelle, Elizabeth, anything else that you'd like to share? Um, the last thing I would like to share is that you probably heard me talk a lot about what the Senate is doing, and that is because the Assembly hasn't come out with anything yet. They have not had a budget hearing to talk about their response to the May revision, and so we anticipate that sometime next week there will be a hearing where we get a better sense of where they stand, um, but we know that the Senate was ready to take action yesterday. We'll keep an eye out and an ear out on um, 
on the assembly and what what they want to uh, what they want to see. Um, and then also the education omnibus trailer bill or the omnibus education bill is out. Um, however, we're still waiting on some of these other technical changes through the trailer bill language. So as Michelle mentioned, um, we'll wait for that to come out and we'll continue to keep you all informed. Um, as part of this presentation, I know it was asked in the chat, it will be, it will be emailed out. Uh, and we'll, we're going to also include and incorporate a handful of materials to some of these links um, when it comes to the May revision, the education omnibus uh, bill, the Senate budget plan. And so we'll make sure to provide all those uh, links to those materials as well. Um, any, any remarks from Michelle, Tasha? No, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Again, want to thank you for your time. We know you're busy. We look forward to seeing you at local section meetings, at symposium, and at next year's annual conference. So thanks again for your participation today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.